The speed of an aeroplane in still air is U kilometers per hour. Now, as I explained in the last video and the video to do with a boat on a river, the speed of an object relative to a still medium, whether it's air or water, gives us the speed of the object relative to that medium. So the speed of the plane, I'll write P for plane, not to be confused with point P, the speed of the plane relative to the wind or air, I could write A for air, but I'll write W for wind, is given by this value here. So that's how we interpret this statement. Okay, it's not VP, it's VPW. In this case, it's some unknown value U. As I've explained before, if the air is still, in other words, if the velocity of the wind is zero, then the velocity of the plane relative to the wind will be equal to the absolute velocity of the plane. That is the velocity of the plane relative to the fixed ground. The aeroplane flies a straight line course from P to Q, where Q is north of P. Now, if it flies a straight line course from P to Q, that tells us that the velocity of the plane, Vp, the absolute velocity of the plane or the velocity of the plane relative to the fixed ground is entirely in the vertical direction. Well, the positive J direction. Well, we don't have to make the direction from P to Q the J direction. We could have made it the I direction, but you know, it's more convenient to consider upwards as being in the positive J direction. So vector VP can be written like this, where VP without the arrow is the constant speed of the plane. The speed is always positive, so we have a vector pointing in the positive J direction. If there is no wind blowing, the time for the journey from P to Q is capital T hours. Now we are not given the distance from P to Q, so let's call that distance X. So we want to eliminate X in our calculations, because everything will ultimately be in terms of U and capital T. So in this first part of the question, the velocity of the wind is zero. So as I've said already, vector VPW equals vector P in this situation, which means that the magnitudes of both of those vectors are the same. And we're given that the magnitude is U. So we could actually write vector VP as U times vector J so u is the magnitude of this vector. So we're dealing with a plane moving with constant speed u towards point q, covering a distance x. Um, well, we know that the speed, if the speed is constant, it's just the distance traveled x divided by the time taken. And we're told the time taken is capital T. And we can rearrange this to get x in terms of little u and big T. And that's what we want. We don't want x appearing in our result. So now we can write u times t for the distance between p and q. So we're using the variables given in the question. Find in terms of u and t the time to fly from p to q if there is a wind blowing from the southeast with a speed of 4 root 2 kilometers per hour. So the wind is blowing from the southeast, so it's blowing uh, in a direction northeast. So VW, the velocity of the wind, makes an angle of 45 degrees with the positive x-axis. As I said in a previous video, we could consider VW to be um, the velocity of the point W, where W is a point moving with the wind. Okay, let's write VW in terms of i and j basis vectors. So we have to get these two components. We multiply 4 root 2 by the cos of 45 to get the j component, or the, sorry, the, the i component. Now the cos of 45 is actually 1 over root 2, which is convenient, because these root 2s cancel out. The side opposite 45 is the hypotenuse 4 root 2 times the sine of 45. Now conveniently, the sine of 45 is also 1 over root 2. So we have uh, 4 root 2 times 1 over root 2, which is 4. So VW is 4i plus 4j. OK, 
okay, both components are positive. So this vector here is 4i and this vector is 4j. So we add these by the triangle law to get vw. Now we are going to have to get vector vp in terms of u and t if we want to get the time taken for the plane to fly from p to q. The time taken won't be capital T uh, as it was before. The time taken was capital T when the wind speed was zero, when there was no wind. But we have the distance in terms of little u and t. What we need to do now is get uh, the speed of the plane, vp, in terms of u and t. And with the distance and speed in terms of u and t, we can get the time taken for, p, for the plane to go from p to q in terms of u and t. So we will do this problem like um, the approach we used in the previous video. We get vpw by using our relative velocity formula. Vp is Vp times j. All we know about Vp is that it's pointing in the positive j direction. We don't know what its magnitude is. We do know what Vw is. That's fully specified. So let's gather this up. The i component appears first. Put the j together. Vp minus 4 times j. So like you've seen in the previous video, we use the fact that the magnitude of VPW is U. So we get the magnitude of this vector. We square the I component. Well, that's going to give us 16. Square the J component. Sum them, take the square root, and this must equal little u. Square both sides and subtract 16 from both sides. We take the square root of both sides. Now I'm taking, implicit in this is that I'm taking the positive square root. I'm not sure if it matters if we take the negative square root, but we won't worry too much about that for now. So, you know, if we take the positive square root, then vp minus 4 is positive. Um, if we consider the negative square root, then vp minus 4 is negative. Okay. Anyway, I'll just leave that off for now and we get vp equals the square root of u squared minus 16 plus 4. So we have the speed of the plane in terms of u, that's good, uh, because our answer has to appear in terms of u and big T. Now the t since we're dealing with constant speed, the time taken for the journey is the, the distance travelled, which is u times big T, divided by the speed which is vp root u squared minus 16 plus 4. And that's what we we need to get. Now, there is another way of doing this. This other method is a geometrical approach. Vector vp, we know, points vertically upwards. It is no i component. Vector vw makes an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal. So the angle between these two vectors must be 45 degrees. Vector VPW is vector VP minus vector VW. So its tail is at the head of VW and its head is at the head of VP. And uh, that's very easy to check by the triangle law. Vector VW plus vector VP minus VW equals VP. The VWs cancel when we add VW onto uh, VPW by the triangle law. Now we are given that the magnitude of vector vpw is u. So we have this side of the triangle. We also have the magnitude of vector vw. It's 4 root 2. We want to get the magnitude of vector vp. That's what we did down here. We got this result. To do that, we will start by getting this angle here. This angle is opposite 4 root 2. We can use a sine rule to get this angle. I'll call this angle alpha. Okay, so here's the sine rule. 4 root 2 over sine alpha equals u over sine 45 degrees. Now the sine of 45 degrees is 1 over root 2. So when we cross multiply, 4 root 2 times 1 over root 2 gives us 4. So we get 4 equals u sine alpha, or sine alpha equals 4 divided by u. Now, it looks very messy here because we see that alpha is inverse sine 
4 over u. Normally when we use the sine rule we would get this angle and uh, once we have this angle we add it to this angle and take the result from 180 to get this angle here. Then we can use this angle to find this side by the sine rule. But we won't actually do it that way. What we will do is divide the triangle into two right angle triangles. So I'm drawing this triangle down here for clarity, I hope. Um, what we will do is get this distance here and add it onto this distance here to get the result, the magnitude of vector VP. Well, this distance here is straightforward. We're in a right angle triangle, so we multiply the hypotenuse 4 root 2 by the cos of 45 degrees. 4 root 2 times cos 45 is 4 root 2 times 1 over root 2. So, as before, we see the uh, root 2 is cancelling, so we get 4. Now, what about this here? Well, we could do something similar. We need to multiply u by the cos of alpha. We don't have the cos of alpha, but you see, that's where this thing comes in. If alpha is an acute angle, then we can construct this right angle triangle, make the side opposite alpha 4, make the hypotenuse u. And uh, if we want the cos of alpha, then we need to use Pythagoras here. So this side adjacent alpha is the square root of the hypotenuse squared minus 4 squared, square root of u squared minus 16. So now we see that cos alpha is adjacent over hypotenuse root u squared minus 16 uh, divided by the hypotenuse, which is u. So we plug root u squared minus 16 over u in for cos alpha, and the u's cancel out. So we now have that this distance is root u squared minus 16. So as before, we get our result. Uh, the magnitude of this side, or this vector, is root u squared minus 16 plus 4. Now there is one small thing that I've just noticed that's not mentioned in the official solution and that is there are two possible alphas uh, whose sine is 4 over u. You see in this triangle here we have two sides and an angle but we do not have an angle side angle situation or you know a side angle side. Um, so you know, this triangle is not u uniquely specified. There are two possible triangles with this configuration. I mean, this point here could have been here. This could be our angle alpha. We haven't changed anything. We haven't changed vector VW. Uh, vector VP is still pointing vertically up in the positive j direction. That's all we know about it. We haven't changed it. And we haven't changed this angle of 45 degrees. So you see that alpha could be an obtuse angle. It could be an angle between, you know, 90 and 180 degrees. See, the sine of alpha here is positive. And the sine function is positive in two quadrants. It's positive in the quadrant where the angles are acute angles between 0 and 90. And it's also positive in the quadrant where the angles are obtuse between, say, 90 degrees and 180 degrees. The sine function is positive. So it's po positive in these two quadrants. So alpha could be an acute angle, like in the picture that I, first picture that I drew, or it could be an obtuse angle, like in this second picture here. Our triangle could have actually looked like this. Now, to be honest, this is really just an aside, what I'm doing here. But just for completion, I'll go through it anyway. We don't really have to be this fuzzy, but um, let's see what happens. So we want to get the length of this line here. Well, the distance from here to here is root u squared minus 16. And it's also the distance from here to here. See, all we've done is reflected this point through this point to get this point here. So this angle is the same as this angle here. See, the sine of the angle with the dot in it is the same as the sine of the angle that's next to it, because these two angles add up to 180 degrees. Um, so now, 
we can clearly see the distance from here to here. It's the distance from this point to this point here, which is 4 minus u squared, the square root of u squared minus 16. So that goes back to what I was saying about taking the positive or negative square root. So we could actually consider the negative square root. That's a possibility. So um, let's see, I'll just highlight this one, this one here in green. Okay, if our triangle looks like this, if alpha is an obtuse angle, then the magnitude of vector vp is going to be minus the square root, or well, I could write it the other way around, I suppose. It's the distance from here to here, which is 4, minus this uh, purple distance here, which is root u squared minus 16. Of course, you could just combine these two results that cover both possibilities by just putting a plus or minus in front of the square root sign. You see, usually when the plus or minus is left off, it's assumed that we're taking the positive square root. But since we can take the positive or negative square root here, we need to put in both signs. So we get the same result as we did using the first method, but I've just um, put in this little adjustment here, which you don't have to worry about really. It's not in the official solution. So the distance traveled was u times capital T as we saw, and we divide that by the speed of the plane.